Coming up on this episode of On The Farm, I chat to Joe Ives and George Lester catches up with MP Alicia Kearns. Farming has always had to deal with a unique set of challenges, but none more so as in the most recent years. A reduction in price received for produce and a growing demand, all the while dealing with increased costs and a limited workforce in this post-Brexit world, have caused rapid change. Many farmers are now turning to more and more technology to help claw back that much needed profit, all the while doing so while focusing on their climate impact. British Daring has come to Park Farm here near Basingstoke in Hampshire to meet Joe Ives, a Gold Cup finalist and a Cream Award winner who has embraced technology to achieve some pretty impressive results. I was born on the farm here uh, many, many years ago. Uh, parents came here in 1958 when they just got married and uh, got the tenancy, so we were tenants on Herriot Estate here. So, um, and then we've added land over the years, so we're about 500 acres farm here, mostly for the dairy, but we've got arable as well, so we've got about 170 odd acres of wheat, um, which we sell for bread making. Uh, the rest is maize and grass, which we use for, for feeding the cows. 250 uh, head of milking cows milked on robots, which we've, um, we put in four years ago now. So we've been milking on, on that system, which is, suits us down to the ground, and about 250 head of young stock as well. We sell a lot of young stock, uh, so we, we use a lot of sex semen, so then we've got a lot of young stock uh, to sell. So. What would you say are the, the biggest challenges you face here, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis? You're always battling the weather, you're always battling the labour problems that the industry has got and wading through, you know, piles of paperwork and ever-changing political scene as well. Now clearly you embrace technology, there's lots to be seen here. How has this maybe improved your day-to-day -day life? Uh, really interesting. I was a very late developer on the technological front, uh, never until I got an iPad 12 years ago, never had a computer, didn't use a computer, always got someone else to do the stuff, but embraced it pretty well. I, I am still not totally proficient, but I could see the benefits for our herd. We were always high yielding, three times a day, labour was a problem, uh, the, the, the whole infrastructure on the farm was quite run down and we had to do some drastic investment. Looked around at robots for quite a few years before we actually installed them and thought that would suit our cows. Sort of high yielding cows, barn housed all year round. And then obviously the technology that comes with that and the information you get with that has just been terrific. And we know that if a, if a cow is being milked on a three times a day system, it kind of depends on who's actually milking it on some of the nights milkings, you might get relief staff who might not be doing quite as good a job. I know with the robots that the same job is done the same way every single day, every single milking, uh, and that's been a real benefit. So. so what sort of technology do you have here on the farm? You've got the robots, of course, but what else? I mean, the cows have got these rather fetching collars on. So it's got a transponder on their necks, and that measures then sort of basically how many times they chew per minute and that gives us a, sort of an indication of how their guts are working. The robots got weigh cells on them, so we weigh the cows every single milking. They analyse all the milk, uh, temperature for mastitis, and analyse all that, and for butterfat and protein, so we get real live data on that. So all that information, the different information, is fed back to the computer, gives us emergency lists straight away. It was the first place we look in the morning and afternoon when we come in and tells us which cows are performing well, which cows aren't performing, which cows are coming on heat, which cows might, might be going down with a problem before you'd ever notice it normally. So, so the data and then learning how to use that has been a real bonus and our team have embraced that. And it has aided them and helped their, helped their work significantly actually and, and, and cow health. So before we put in robots, we were 17 milligrams of antibiotic per livestock unit, which is still pretty good. Now we are down about five milligrams per livestock unit, which is almost well, below, in some cases, organic levels. Just because the data we're getting, we can just go in with non-antibiotics first and, um, and treat, treat any cows that might be going to get a problem before they actually get a problem. Investment in technology, now that's quite a, a lot up front, quite a big initial investment. How quickly do you see a return on that? It is it's a significant outlay up front. You know, that, that's the big thing. It's um, big capital, capital outlay. 
but our yield, we were 12,000 litres a year um, for the herd average. Before that, we are now about 14,000 litres a year. So we've gone up 2,000 litres, not just because of the robots, but also work we've done on the cubicles and housing and everything else as a, as a whole. So that extra 2,000 litres per cow, you could say, is, is attributed to the work we did on the robots and everything else. We got a 40% European grant funding on the robots, which obviously helped on the robots themselves, on the robot pushers and on the robot rooms. So that was a significant amount there. I would think, and we had a very good year, as a lot of the dairy industry did last year, uh, 2022. This year, not so good, obviously. So to put, to put a, how long will it pay back, is, is very difficult. But it's not just financial. We're all having problems employing more people. This has given us a better chance to employ better people, better skilled people, and give them more time off and give them a better working environment, which I think going forward is our, is our long-term aim. Is one, it's made it a lot better for the cows. They are so much more relaxed. You know, if you look around here, how chilled out they are. They spend an hour a day milking and 23 hours a day eating and lying down and just chilling out. They are so much quieter than they ever were on when we were conventional milking. So that's a real bonus. I like the way we're doing everything better from, from the cow's point of view, from the people's point of view. And then financially, obviously the, the yields we're getting, the less antibiotics and things we're using. So financially, there's obviously a benefit. Technology is clearly a positive for Joe, but what about the impact farming has on the climate and the role UK government has to play? As a dairy farmer, George Lester knows all too well the perception among the general public and he chatted to Alicia Kearns MP on how farming and policy makers need to work hand in hand. So in Parliament obviously there are hundreds of different issues that MPs care about passionately and dairy for me is a natural fit because obviously I represent just 70 dairy farmers in the north of my constituency let alone the rest. Um, so essentially the goal of the APPG is to bring together MPs who care passionately about supporting our dairy sector. We may not be dairy farmers ourselves, we may not be experts but we want to make sure that government listens to the voice of dairy farmers and all those involved in the dairy production chain. Something I'd quite like to know is how could dairy farmers and all farmers make better use of their local MPs? Do exactly what we're doing here today. So invite in your MP, show them what the reality of dairy farming is, um, show them the realities and offer them to muck in for a day. Every single MP would love to come and help, whether it's calving season or milking or just mucking out on the average day. Invite them along because on an average day MPs deal with 20 or 30 subjects. So you need to make sure they know what's going on in terms of dairy because you can't expect them to know everything that's going on within your industry. So invite them along and tell them. The new announcement about tackling unfair dairy contracts mm. sounds good in theory, but in practice, how will that be affected by the supply and demand uh, state mm. of our market at the moment? So one of the things the APPG will be doing is monitoring the success of them. But the goal is largely to share risk along the supply chain, so making sure that farmers themselves aren't yielding too much of it, um, things like dealing with like contractual exclusivity, things like that. We're really hopeful it will help farmers and support them because that's our priority. But that's my job. So if you as a dairy farmer feel that it's not working, write to your MP so that they can come to me and we can work together to say to government, do you know what? We need a little bit of a tweak. It's one thing farmers could look to do uh, to increase their income is to diversify into other areas. What sort of things would either you suggest or what sort of ways can the government help farmers in to diversify? So look, my constituency is the home of Stilton. Um, obviously, uh, I'm always going to talk about cheese and champion cheese as much as I can. Um, but actually what I see when I go around my constituency is my farmers are all diversifying, whether it's becoming wedding venues, whether it's becoming school education providers, um, whether it's providing you know, yogurts, cheese, uh, you name it, all sorts of different products. So I think they're doing an amazing job of it. What actually we need to do is change the conversation nationally around how important dairy is. Um, you know, when I was growing up, when you were growing up, there was no question that milk was an absolutely intrinsic part of your, you know, growing up and your health. And we've stepped away from that and you see children drinking water rather than milk. Yes, water's important, but milk is such a key ingredient. Um, so I would love to see us get more talking about, again, how dairy and milk is so important for you. Another area that dairy farmers are coming under pressure from is from vegan alternatives, yeah. the almond milk, the uh, oat milk. What should farmers be doing to insulate themselves from those other areas? 
So I don't think this is a job for farms to do. I think it's the job of the common sense member of the British public and the government to be having a conversation about this. Why have we got into a place where people genuinely believe that these dairy alternatives are better for the environment? They are just not. If you look at their transport, if you look at the way they're produced, if you look at the amount of water needed to produce some of these, they're not as good. It is a natural product coming from cows that are grazing on British grass that have been grown sustainably. That is the right product. And actually what we are starting to see now is actually a lot of these vegan, you know, fake bacon and other products they're actually diminishing in sales, at least in my part of the world, although we are steadfast supporters of farmers in Rutland Melt and the Vale and Harbour villages. So actually, I want us to move away from faddish things like saying, well, let's all go vegan. I want us to have a meaningful conversation about why dairy is really good for you. And I want us to get rid of this appalling narrative that these vegan militias and climate extremists are running around with, where they're suggesting that the milk coming out of these incredible cows isn't good for you and isn't actually that locally eating local is much better than eating soy and avocados from across the other side of the world. So do you think your thoughts are reflected across the government from the Department of Health and things like that? So I think there is a systemic problem where both Department of Education and Department of Health need to do more in terms of A, the education around local food. So, you know, home economics classes, young children in schools, they should be learning about why dairy is so important. But the Department of Health needs to do a lot more to make sure, in the same way that we make sure we educate people about breastfeeding, we need to make sure we're educating about the benefits of milk for young people and actually people throughout their lives. One of my pet concerns is that UK dairy farmers are being forced to reduce their carbon footprint even further when we would be better served selling our low carbon milk around the globe and allowing other countries to focus on more um, carbon reducing measures in their own countries. So we in the UK produce so much low carbon milk and it's really important that we export that around the world and I think exports can be a real boon but whilst we are transitioning towards net zero, we need to do so without harming the livelihoods of dairy farmers. And so it is a sensitive balance. But if there's a choice, of course, we should be leading by example and we should be expect exporting more of our milk because others should be adopting and more sustainable models like the UK does. The world's population is expected to be 10 billion by 2050. How do we balance this with the, the reduction in food production in the UK? So I think we have a duty to increase agricultural output. We are an incredible producer of outstanding high quality food done in incredibly sustainable manners. We already have a global food crisis. Put on that the renewed illegal invasion of Ukraine. We have a duty to lead actually. And so I actually want to see an increase in agricultural output. And if you look at the conversations in Parliament, that is clearly what all parliamentarians want to see. So farmers are already seeing increased costs with complying with the current legislation to do with carbon footprinting and there's predicted to be more coming in the future. Over the next 10 years there could be up to 2 billion of extra costs uh, that farmers will have to at the moment find in order to comply with things like the Clean Air Act. Yeah. What can be done to help smooth the transition, smooth those payments to farmers? Sure. So in the immediate, my priority is how do we deal with the input costs? So, you know, fertiliser, feed and energy, making sure we don't see even greater inflation around those. But long term, I, I think we have to have an honest conversation with the public. If you want the highest quality milk in the world, if you want something that is organic, sustainably farmed, locally farmed, you will have to look at paying slightly more for that because actually it's about the food chain we shouldn't be seeing is supermarkets as we currently do which is what we're trying to deal with with the new contracts just driving down farmers and ultimately driving them out of business i think there is a responsible conversation to be held with taxpayers and with consumers that people aren't always willing to have um, but this is about supporting your local economy and i think after the pandemic in particular People are more aware of the fact that shopping local, supporting local matters, but they've fallen back into those bad habits of going back to the big conglomerates when they want to do their shopping. So I think actually a responsible government would have a responsible conversation. So all farmers are suffering at the moment with increased input costs like fertiliser and electricity. Yeah. What could be done to help solve these problems? So making sure that inflation doesn't get worse is obviously the immediate priority. Making sure that we look to new countries to bring in fertiliser. So countries like Jordan who are saying we're here, we're producing fertiliser, you know, diversifying supply chains, the government should be leading on that. Um, but also one of the things I'm arguing for is a gas fertiliser price index because I think it would give more certainty. It doesn't solve all the problems, but it gives more certainty to farmers and allow them to plan longer term. Rural mental health has obviously been in the uh, press fairly recently and the government have admitted that there is a problem yeah. and they're willing to help. I've got personal experience of a friend who works within rural mental health training who's just had their budget slashed by £200,000 in order to help uh, our local authority. How can the government claim that they are 
understanding and supporting rural mental health matters at the same time as yeah. having budget slashed in local communities. So that's really disappointing. Obviously, I, I don't know about that specific case, but this is something that I've been trying to champion really hard because it is such strenuous work. There is very few other jobs in the world where it is seven days a week. It is 365 days a year. The costs when you have a difficult time or period are so extreme on not just you, but your family and everyone around you. Um, and so I know that we've launched the Future Farm Resilience Fund, and that's meant to provide this sort of funding but we need to do more because there's the inherent mental health challenges that come with this but there's also the attacks on the climate fanatics the vegan militias um, I've had dairy farms in my constituency have these so-called what I call vegan militias breaking into their farm uh, letting loose the cows which ultimately just scares the cows themselves um, and has caused damage to some of them has caused some of them to get injured so first of all we need to have a national conversation about how this is unacceptable we will not allow farmers to be stigmatized in the way that we are seeing the media and those particularly of a certain uh, mentality attack them but secondly that actually this is an industry that unfortunately inherently is long hours often working on your own in a very isolated space with enormous pressures put on you and your family we have to make sure that funding is getting to where it's getting to and I would really urge your friend to write to their MP and make sure that that is getting put back in place because the funding has been provided by government we need to make sure it's being rolled out. Well, thanks very much for coming to see us today on the farm, Alicia. Coming and checking out what we do and looking at the great British dairy production. No, thank you for having me. It's been a joy as ever. Lots of cud to chew over. We thank George Lester and Alicia Cairns MP and of course Joe Ives for showing us around his tech-friendly farm. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of On the Farm and we hope to see you next time. Hey.